thank you, Michael, very much for the invitation. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here, and um, it, it's a really interesting meeting. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about the role of inflammation which in, in tendon disease and its relationship to degeneration, or, or as I, for various reasons, prefer to call it uh, fib fibrosis. I think, I think um, I might try and persuade you to at least consider that as an interchangeable term with fibrosis. One of the things we're struggling with, if not the main thing that we're struggling with, is understanding what it is that takes cells and cellular systems within tendon from a, an, a sort of early stages of a disease phenotype in, to heal and recover or to fail to heal and become more long-term or persistently abnormal, a process, generally speaking, uh, referred to in other systems as fibrosis. And it is remarkable at the moment, I think, how aligned a number of different research groups are becoming in this space, whether they're working in the liver, the lung, or the kidney. And a lot of musculoskeletal systems, I think, map onto basic research in these other areas. And this, this is certainly the terminology that those other research groups are using. And I, I think we should perhaps consider it. That there has been, as I mentioned on Wednesday, some dispute about the role of um, inflammation and tendonitis and the, the sort of weight of clinical review opinion is perhaps against inflammation, whereas the weight of basic science review is, is becoming a little bit more towards the, the fact that there's a, a role of inflammation in, in tendon disease. And this, this is a, one of my uh, PhD students has done uh, sort of trying to pull together a consensus, but I think we were trumped by uh, Craig's fantastic review a few minutes ago of the whole world of tendinopathy. Uh, that was a, a, a surreal tour de force uh, lecture, which I, I very much enjoyed. One aspect that I and uh, others have been trying to pursue is drilling down into the mechanism of tendon disease, and it's very difficult to do this, in my view, just from models, particularly from animal models, which don't particularly well replicate aspects of human disease. So therefore, in some way and in some form, we need to get access to the right materials that will allow us to discover mechanism. And that means, from my perspective, getting access to human tissue and cells to dissect and interrogate what's going on at the different stages of disease, why some people progress, why some people don't, why some people have symptoms, why some people don't, why some tendons rupture, why some tendons don't. We've got to get access to material and look at it in a new way, in, in ways that we can do in, this, in these last few years that we couldn't do five years ago, let alone 10 years ago. So developing means by which you can access tissues is, has for me, has been crucial. It, and I've only really been working in tendon for about eight or nine years. I was in, in osteoarthritis predominantly before that. But I think getting hold of tissue is important. I, there are various ways of doing this. I've focused on the rotator cuff tendons of the shoulder and have developed a technique for repeated on occasions or isolated in the majority biopsies in the crucial zone of the tendon where the pathology is occurring. We can now do this safely, in my view, in the outpatient setting, ultrasound-guided local anesthetic biopsies. And that's getting us access to a lot more tissue. And um, we're discovering what's happening. This isn't sequential biopsies. This is a series of cross-sectional biopsies going through the different stages of rotator cuff disease. And not surprisingly, what we see is increased levels of cell senescence or apoptosis in the more advanced stages of disease. Um, we also see uh, changes in the vascularity of the tendon in the different stages of the disease. In the later stages of the disease, there is a predominantly fibrotic picture. And I think this is probably where some of the confusion has arisen. In the, in the past, most of the samples that people got access to were of later stage disease, where the predominant finding is of degeneration or fibrosis, often with really quite substantial extracellular matrix changes, deposition of calcium phosphate, or crystals, hydroxyapatite, and amyloid, and such disorganization that the cells that exist within that tissue have got all the wrong signals and cues, and they actually change their phenotypes. So they, 
many of these cells become, rather than tenocyte-like, actually chondrocyte-like, and they start producing proteins like type 2 collagen. So we, we get morphological changes and we get behavioral changes in tissue that has got to this very end stage of the fibrotic process. But I, what I wanted to do was try and get earlier in the journey and to see what was going on and ask the question, is there, or not, is there not evidence of an inflammatory process in some form? And it, it's worth just perhaps just rehearsing or reminding ourselves of what the classic story of inflammation is. Um, this is clearly not necessarily totally applicable to the tendon, but this is the story that you get initiation with pro-inflammation, you again get resolution with pro-resolution, and there are various mediators of these processes. They clearly overlap, and they clearly can go over different time zones. The cell recruitment, and I decided to focus initially on looking at cellular characteristics in tissue, neutrophils initially, monocytes and macrophages, and then with a very important but lowest number of T cells and mast cells also playing a part in, in the process. So through access to tissue actually from a trial I'd been running, we did find evidence of inflama inflammatory cells in tendon tissue, and the, the numbers of those cells were greater in the earlier stages rather than the later stages of the disease, which sort of fit the theories that we were developing. And we and others have sort of put together some reviews of what's out there and, and have looked at all the various papers which Craig so eloquently discussed earlier. I think it is clearer to me now that at various crucial stages of the process of tendon disease, inflammation has a part to play. And therefore, that in the, uh, I described it like a, a, a sort of game on a pitch, if you think there are a whole series of players on that game on the pitch, some of the players in tendon disease, in my view, are immune cells, inflammatory cells. Uh, probably not terribly importantly, the neutrophil, and if you think inflammation is just the neutrophil, then maybe that's why there's confusion. But other cells, particularly Treg cells and the macrophage. And the macrophage is an important regulator of tissue damage and its, and its healing. And there isn't just one kind. Indeed, there aren't just two kinds of macrophage. But the, the classic story is that in the early phases of inflammation, the regulatory cell, the pro-inflammatory cell, is the so-called M1 macrophage, and then that hands over the job, the business, to the. so it's like a substitution coming on. You get the, the first player comes in and sort of beats up the opposition, and then the, guy, the next player comes in and scores the goal. That's the M2 macrophage. And the M2 macrophage is the tissue... Re oh, forgive me, Michael, for that. And that's... <laughs> I'm going, he'll tear me apart <laughs> later on. The tissue repairing macrophage then comes in and the handover of those roles. In fact, probably it's better to consider both players being on the pitch for quite a lot of the, the match together in order to achieve the objective. And just to sort of illustrate that a bit more, here's some work done looking at the role of inflammation and, and cell replacement and looking actually at the important difference between a neonate and an elderly person, an adult, in the neonate, if you damage cardiac muscle and you've got macrophages present, you'll actually repair to normality. If you remove the macrophages from the neonatal heart that's damaged, it heals with scarring. It actually heals very much in the way that an adult heart heals if you damage it. So it's clear, firstly, that there's a difference between young tissue and old tissue, but also that macrophages are crucially important. What we can now do is define these macrophage subtypes in a lot of detail using both cell surface and intracellular markers. Um, the detail of, of that is not important. What is important is that this is a complicated story of the interplay of a whole series of different inflammatory and immune cells that come into the game at different stages and have crucial roles. If you disrupt that interplay of these cells, then you will probably disrupt normal healing and you will tend to move towards fibrosis. So what we've been trying to do is develop some cohorts that we've tracked longitudinally from a baseline when they come and see us with symptoms. They then get treatment, be that an injection or some form of surgery, and we've then followed them clinically and we've rebiopsied them. At three months, 
and then going out as far as five years. So we've now got cohorts of patients that we've got both the population study of and the individual study of to monitor at a cellular level what's going on in their tendons. And what I think is one aspect that's important is this relationship between what we see in the tissue and pain. And if you've got a persistently painful tendon after treatment, you will have more of these inflammatory cells still present. So the pain-free tendons, the monocytes and macrophages tend to disappear away. In the pain, persistently painful tendons, you have more of those cells present. So that, I think, is an important sort of observation, confirming, in a way, this hypothesis. These cells are also related in some way to the activation of nociceptors, to, to, the in, to pain. And we've looked at a series of different pain pathways, and the most interesting for one for us at the moment is, is, the, is the neurosensitization of the glutamate pathway. So a, a particular component of the nociceptive possibilities and its receptor, both are upregulated in people with more pain. So here's another sort of, if you like, interesting component that we might derive from examination of cells and tissues. So what we've subsequently done is try to look in more detail at what causes activation and what causes resolution. And this is a paper, uh, Steph Dakin, a member of my group, and, and we published uh, at the end of last year. And what we wanted to ask was, what about this macrophage interplay, the polarization of M1 and M2 macrophages? If you get good behavior of your macrophages, do you go to um, minimal scarring? If you get bad behavior of your macrophages, do you go towards um, fibrosis? And that, it does seem, from these tissues that we've looked at, that the macrophages are changing their behavior and their number in the way that we predict, would predict. So in early disease, we've got more M1 macrophages. In later disease, we've got more M M2 macrophages. And the macrophage type changes depending on whether you resolve your symptoms or you don't resolve your symptoms. And so that we were finding more macrophage, M2 macrophages in, in, in tendons that become pain-free, and they were decreased in tendons that with persistent pain, and vice versa for the M1 macrophage. So this theory that we put forward, this hypothesis that we put forward about these cells being important, appears to be being confirmed in the observation of what's actually going on in patients as they respond or don't respond to treatment. It's not just the macrophages. There are also other cells present, and it's only by using quite sophisticated cellular immunological techniques that we can find this out. So this is just, this just, you don't need to worry about the detail of this, but in the top left-hand corner, that's our initial screen using a, a, a system called, uh, of cell sorting, fax it's called. And the blue is what we would call the stroma. That's the whole population of tenocytes. And what we can do is by spreading these, these cells out, we can select out different cell types. And what you'll see is the proportion of the cells that are immune cells is terribly small. It's, it's a few percent. But they're there, and they're active, and they're there in greater numbers than in normal tissue. So although we might miss them by looking at a conventional stained slide, they are there if you look at them with the right technique. So the analogy is like looking at the sky with a telescope. If you only look at the sky with your naked eye, there's a whole lot you'll miss. The bigger the telescope you get, the, um, the better you get a view of the sky and what's out there. I'm quite sure that there are some black holes in the tendon, and we still haven't seen those, because as far as I know, there's mi no microscope capable of doing that. But looking at this tissue in a more and more sort of sophisticated way, if you like, that's a good, the right term, the more we're seeing. And what's absolutely clear is the macrophages are there, and they're changing their number and behavior in the way that we would predict if they were players, and T cells are there, T reg cells are there, and they're also changing their number and behavior uh, as we would predict. I think what, and again, Craig mentioned this, one of the most interesting things that we've picked up in this recent piece of work 
is that it's not just the behavior of these immune cells, that actually the general population of cells also are changed their behavior. So it's like having a great big crowd in a square, and it, they're behaving in a particular way. If you put into that crowd five or six agitators, people who start going around stirring up trouble, then what happens is that whole crowd changes its behavior in a particular direction. And that, if you like, is we observe in human nature in certain situations. That's what's going on in tendon, that the, the inflame, inflammatory and immune cells are coming in, they're adopting a particular behavior, and they're polarizing the resident cells, such that those cells become in, behave in a more agitated way. And I think as we develop novel strategies, we need to be targeting not just the orchestrators, but also we need to be changing the behavior of the general population of cells. And these cells will respond not just to chemical signals, but to biomechanical signals. So maybe some of the things that we're doing at the moment that are changing, if you like, the mechanical loading of tendon are actually deregulating some of this stromal polarization that's gone on. So the final bit I just want to talk about is that some of this work is also now generating new targeted anti-inflammatory strategies. So what we can do is look at these populations of stromal cells and see what agents, by, by multiple screening with lots of, different, um, lots of different drug targets, what switches them back to a normal state. And we're now beginning to derive some, I think, quite interesting targets that might end up with therapeutic value going forward. So what I, I hope I've put to you is a story of inflammation, a story of inflammation and its relationship to fibrosis, that this inflammation does not have the same course for every patient or every person. There are genetic and environmental factors that determine whether or not that inflammation resolves, whether it persists with pain above a nociceptive threshold, whether it persists without pain below a nociceptive threshold, or whether it actually never hits a nociceptive threshold and causes fibrosis which leads to rupture in a patient that never had symptoms at all. So by mapping out and understanding this longitudinal story of the role of inflammation and its relationship to fibrosis and understanding where and when to target new therapies, to me, is the way forward in tendinopathy. Thanks very much. The next uh, 20 minutes, I will try to convince you that the nervous system is highly involved, integrated in all parts of tendinopathy. So uh, if you will follow me during the next 20 minutes, you will be convinced. So the aim of uh, my research group at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm is to examine the role of the nervous system in regulation of pain and in tissue repair, which are two, I believe, quite integrated uh, processes. The clinical part, as an orthopedic surgeon, uh, I would like to use these therapies to help my patients and to, to get their problems, and tendinopathies in special, to heal. So in my presentation, the outline, I'm going to try to integrate the nervous system in the different parts of tendinopathy. So I'll touch on different parts of tendinopathy, and I will try to convince you uh, where the nervous system is integrated into these different parts and how the nervous system actually acts on the tendon to regulate the tendon in different stages. Let us uh, look at uh, just shortly introduction and epidemiology. I mean, you're quite aware that uh, tendinopathy is a huge problem and uh, this is uh, maybe one of the most uh, prominent causes uh, for our patients to seek a GP. But in also in sports, that's uh, our main interest maybe while we're here, is that the athletes, half of the athletes are affected by tendinopathy. 
and it's the main reason why the athletes have to stop training and competition. And uh, in Denmark, you might know this uh, soccer player. And um, I don't know if this works. I didn't bring a, a, f a photo from the game with, uh, uh, with Denmark because that was, I thought that would be rude. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if you can see this, but have a look at that. Okay. <laughs> so this is something that we are proud of in, in Sweden. Okay, back to, to reality. Uh, how does this couple? So that's what we are, I mean, we're interested in, in, in sports and relationship to this. But for treating our athletes and our patients, we also have to understand the underlying pathology. Uh, what happens to our patient? What is the underlying pathology? How can we help them? And uh, let us have a look, because I think a lot of you, including me, uh, for a long time, have not considered that a lot of our patients that come to us, including athletes, have underlying disorders which may affect the treatment of the tendon problems. So we know that one out of three patients with Achilles tendinopathy uh, is not active in sports or exposed to overload of the Achilles tendon. So there are other things which might be uh, underlying the problem or predispose the patient to uh, develop tendinopathy. So we have to consider metabolic disorders like obesity, hypertension, uh, hypercholesterolemia, which are very important uh, for development of tendinopathy. So when you see your patients, exclude and check screen for other disorders in your patients when you are examining them. And also, because I will talk about the nervous system, the common uh, denominator of these underlying disorders is that the nervous system is involved in the pathophysiology of a lot of metabolic and inflammatory disorders. And I will come back to that and try to convince you how that works. Another thing which we have to inform our patients and athletes about is which drugs could they take while performing sports. So drugs which have clearly reported increased risk of tendinopathy and rupture are statins, uh, quinolone antibiotics, and cortisone. And I think you should also be very cautious with uh, low molecular weight heparins like fragments, NSAIDs, immunosuppressive drugs like cyclosporin or uh, chemotherapies. Inform your athletes about this. And also, if you look at the basic science, it's very interesting. The common denominator of a lot of these drugs, they are, to some extent, neurotoxic. Some of them decrease the level of substance P, which is a neuromediator, which I will come back to, which is very important in the tendon homeostasis. Don't forget that many patients which you meet may have genetic disorders, variants. There is a twin study showing that there is a 40% heritability for uh, elbow tendinopathy. Gene variants uh, can increase the risk of tendinopathy, and these gene variants may include uh, extracellular matrix proteins like tennessine C, fibrillin, collagen variants, and also matrix metalloproteinases. There's also some uh, pro-inflammatory regulators, which there is not so much information about yet. If we look into tendinopathy, there is no information yet about variants of different neuromediators, but it would not surprise me when some of these researchers in this field would look into that because in different inflammatory conditions, 
it's quite well known that substance P has variants within different patients, which is a cause, underlying cause, predisposing the patients to develop tendinopathy. So, don't forget to ask your patients about uh, their family history, prior problems with tendons, because this will tell you if your athletes has a risk to develop new tendon problems. So let us look more closely into the pathology from a macro to micro perspective. What does actually happen within the tendon uh, when it develops to tendinopathy? We know that the healthy tendon should be shiny white, fiber elastic, has high resistance to mechanical stress, whereas the pathologic tendon is gray amorphous and has an increased risk of rupture. We know that this is an underlying pathology for a lot of the ruptures that we see out in the sports field. How does this look if we go to a microstructure? So, I usually give these two images to my children. And, uh, you know, there's a game where you tell your children, check these two pictures and give me five differences which you can see in the figures. So you can try the same game right now. What are the differences between these two figures? And which one is the normal and which is the abnormal tendon? Well, you know, the healthy tendon has um, parallel uh, collagen fibers which are longitudinally orientated along the mechanical axis of the loading of the tendon. Whereas the tendinosis uh, has hypercellularity, has a wavy collagen structure, and increase in blood vessels. Let us have a look more detailed into the anatomy of the tendon, and let's have a look at the tendon neuroanatomy. I don't know uh, what you learned in uh, school, but what I learned in school was that uh, nerve fibers were either myelinated or unmyelinated and uh, their main function was to transmit pain or to regulate uh, blood vessels. But recent knowledge about nerve fibers, we know that nerve fibers can exhibit different transmitters in various amounts, in various compositions, which together regulate a lot of important information. And I want to connect to the last speaker also, that these mediators are uh, highly involved in fine-tuning inflammatory conditions and also involved in immune regulation, differentiation and growth. So, let's have a look into the intact neuroanatomy of the tendon. Where do we find these nerve fibers and these mediators? We take the Achilles tendon and we look at uh, micrographs at the neuroanatomy. If you look at the proper tendon tissue, it's practically devoid of nerve fibers and neuromediators. Nerve fibers end in the paratenon, which is the metabolically active part of the tendon, and nerve fibers end at the muscular tendinous junctions, which is also the metabolically active part of the tendon, if we look closer, these small nerve fibers partly are located around blood vessels with autonomic neuromediators controlling blood functions, but also around free nerve fibers, like here. And in the free nerve fibers, we find, for instance, substance P, a sensory neuromediator. And the neuromediators are not just there uh, alone. As I told you, there are various compositions of different neuromediators. Here's a staining in red and um, green, with the yellow showing you the co-localization of different neuromediators acting together on tendon homeostasis. Interestingly, they're not only neuromediators causing pain. There seems to exist a anti system also in the tendon, consisting of opioid, 
peptides and of their receptors. There's a co-localization in the paratenome of opioid peptides and their receptors. So let's have a look of the neuroanatomy in tendinopathy. What happens in tendinopathy? Here's the intact tendon, normal staining, and the intact neuroanatomy. We only see nerve fibers in the paratenone, not within the tendon proper. In tendinopathy, you see here, normal staining, you will see an ingrowth of nerve fibers within the tendon proper. And we see that this is an ingrowth which does not seem to retract because we know that nerve ingrowth is a normal physiologic reaction to tissue injury. In tendon repair, we see nerve ingrowth during the proliferative phase, which successively retracts back to the tendon envelope, to the paratenon, which normally reside after the healing process. But in the chronic tendinopathy, probably this nerve ingrowth is trying to help the tendon to heal, but the normal regu uh, regulation, which regulates the retraction of nerve fibers back to the tendon sheet, does not work normally. So we have a protractive ingrowth of nerve in the tendon proper. And we know from neurophysiology that nerve fibers can mediate pain in response to either mechanical, thermal, or chemical stimuli. So let's have a look at what we have here in the tendon. Just first to, to summarize the pathology. We have a hypercellularity, we have increased ground substance, and we have an ingrowth of nerve fibers into the tendon proper, which is normally devoid of nerve fibers. What causes, we have to look also, what causes these alterations? What causes these tendinosis alterations? Let's have a look at the normal tendon homeostasis. We know that the most powerful regulation of tendon homeostasis, extracellular matrix formation or degradation, is loading or unloading, respectively. Also, selectivity and growth factors are important things. So we know from work from Copenhagen that after an intensive load of a tendon, we have simultaneously new collagen formation, but we also have a degradation of collagen. So the net uh, production is a net catabolism during the first 24 hours. First, after the 24 hours, there's a net production. However, the exact mechanism for this regulation of the tendons are not yet fully known. And a lot of uh, new information during the last decade show that in tendon homeostasis and adaptation to load, that also different nerve substances are involved in the different regulation of the tendon. And we have collected um, the data from the last decade where we know a little bit more about the neuroanatomy. And this is some of the neuromediators and receptors which have been shown to occur in tendinopathy. Most of the mediators and receptors are upregulated in tendinopathy, with one exception, that is noradrenaline, which seems to be downregulated in tendinopathy. The exact cause why noradrenaline is downregulated is not fully known, but we suspect that noradrenaline uh, may be an inhibitor of pain, and thus, uh, when it's downregulated, may lose its pain inhibiting. But there are a lot of uh, speculations about this. So I'm trying now to convince you that there are a lot of alterations in the nervous system occurring in the pathology of tendinopathy. But how can load 
lead to tendinosis? How does this occur? These are some of the hypotheses which have been thrown up during the last 20 years. The reactions to repetitive load. There is one uh, study from the UK, I think, where they put in uh, thermometers into the tendon of racehorses and they found elevated temperature up to 40 or over 40 degrees within the tendon. And the uh, idea of hyperthermia, that where you cook the protein, uh, was founded. Inflammation, we just heard about. It's still not decided how it works. Hypoxia is another very important factor. And then we have a nerve and blood vessel ingrowth into the tendon proper. And these nerve and blood vessels, as I recently showed you, they release a lot of different neuromediators and they cause the so-called neurogenic inflammation. So, how is the ingrowth of nerves and blood vessels into the tendon regulated? These are some of the known regulatory factors. We know that mechanical stress or either also a tendon injury, and specifically if you have a bad load, presumably, this will lead to ingrowth of nerve fibers into the tendon. Hypoxia is another factor, and then we have different chemical factors, like nerve mediators, like nerve growth factors, and other factors. So, these are the regulators of nerve ingrowth into the tendon. And what happens after that? Well, there are recent studies now showing that the nerves uh, in the tendons, they release uh, different factors, which can also be produced by the tendon themselves. And these different substances have been shown to cause cell proliferation. And one of the substances is substance P, causing cell proliferation of tenocytes, also of tendon-derived stem cells, which we'll probably hear more about specifically. Uh, they can also cause proliferation of nerves, of blood vessels, and one of the potentiator of substance P is glutamate, which increases the cell excitability. So, uh, some of the conclusion about tendon pathology is that we have a repetitive mechanical stress, maybe due to incorrect biomechanical load, leading to nerve and blood vessel ingrowth into the tendon proper, and these uh, nerves release different chemical substances, like substance P, and they produce some of the changes which we see in tendinopathy. Another of the questions which uh, my patients always ask me when they come to me, where does the pain come from in uh, tendinopathy? Some of the old hypothesis is that collagen is degenerated, there is inflammation which still is under debate, or that there is a blood vessel ingot. But uh, a lot of studies with Doppler do not show a correlation between uh, blood vessel ingot and, and pain. But we know that nerves can mediate pain on different types of stimuli. And one of those stimuli are different biochemical substances. But there is also more intriguing factors on nerves, which we have to look at. But we know that nerve ingrowth is present. We know that these different stimuli exist. And another factor is that we know that sensitization is present, both peripherally uh, and also shown during the later years, there is a central sensitization. And we have shown that the peripheral sensitization occurring in tendinopathy relates to upregulation of different uh, pain receptors. One of those is uh, NMDR1, the glutamate receptor, which is about tenfold, almost tenfold upregulated. Another uh, part of the glutamate receptor, which is more pain active 
in painful conditions is the so-called phospho-NMDA receptor. And this receptor also activated as probably as part of a sensitization in tendinopathy. So yes, an upregulation of several nociceptor is there as part of sensitization of tendinopathy. So in conclusion, pain and tendinopathy, we have nerve ingrowth, we have a chemical stimuli, we have a sensitization, upregulation of nociceptors, and also activation of these specific nociceptors. And probably, possibly, we could interact with these different nociceptors. They may form uh, novel targets for pharmacotherapy of tendinopathy. And in general, both if it's uh, a therapy targeted to this, or if it's physiotherapy, I think we should think more about the treatment which should promote a proper function of the nervous system. So just shortly on treatment, this will not focus uh, on treatment at all. I just want to highlight uh, some parts on how treatment and the current treatment modalities which we're using can incorporate the nervous system. But one fact is that the treatment which we should use has to target the underlying cause. And it is my belief that a lot of treatments out there are not targeting the underlying cause because we do not know the underlying cause fully. So if you Google, for example, uh, tendinitis and tendinopathy, you have over one million hits. You have a lot of hits, and a lot of the therapies are very unspecific. So if you look a little bit about the evidence, and that's, uh, this is one uh, example, one study trying to sort the evidence, we may see that eccentric exercise and maybe also extracorporeal shockwave are two of the most evidenced treatment for tendinopathy. Is there anything there showing us the, uh, that these treatments could uh, affect the nervous system? Yes. Uh, we know that eccentric exercise should be performed daily for at least 12 weeks to be uh, effective. It improves pain function and also, and this is something I tell my patients to motivate them to do it, it can also reverse the tendinosis changes. Think about the treatment which could reverse the changes in OA. Uh, I motivate my patients that way. Uh, but we know also from a lot of studies that activate, uh, that um, eccentric exercise activates the nervous system. It upregulates the nerve growth factor, uh, glial-derived neuro, uh, neurotropic factor, and neuropeptides. So there are several pathways involving the nervous system. Extracorporeal shockwave treatment is effective single therapy, but also potentiates the effect in some studies of eccentric exercise. And it activates the nervous system. Release of growth factors promote axonal regeneration. Other uh, less uh, you know, uh, gr high-graded procedures may, may affect the nervous system, partly by correcting biomechanical loading, partly by neurophysiological actions, improving the nerve function of the patients. But we know much less about these therapies. So there's a lot out there to do research on. So in conclusions for the treatments, uh, we should be focused on strengthening the tendon, avoiding underlying pathophysiologic loading, maybe combining eccentric exercise and shockwave treatments, and we should look much more into how these treatments affect the nervous system and promote the nervous system function. And we should target the underlying pathology, which we are possibly just scratching on the edge of learning how the underlying pathology of tendinopathy looks like. 
I want to thank you very much, and I'm welcome to take uh, any question that this arises. Thank you, Paul. Uh, pain is a complicated thing, so maybe you could expand a little bit on your, your thoughts on the fact that you, when you develop tendinopathy, it's not just an either-or, I mean, on the temporal pattern. You very often have a situation where you, <clears throat> you can still do exercise, there's pain afterwards, then there is pain when you start, but you can still get loose of it when you have trained, then you tr pain all the time, and then it becomes unbearable. <laughs> so, so where, you know, how do you explain this? I mean, you, you, you alluded to some mechanisms, and are they sort of switched on and off, or are there other things taking in place when you... I, I think the current knowledge is not there, but uh, I, I, I touched upon that we know that nerve fibers and probably the ingrowth that occurs at some stages of tendinopathy can react to mechanical stimuli, chemical stimuli, and also changes in temperature. But the two main stimuli may, may be mechanical, and this is what you allude to. So probably when patients start to feel pain during loading, it may be due to the uh, nerve fibers being there, being activated, during the loading of the tendon. Whereas the other part uh, that you're talking about, uh, maybe let's say it's a post-training pain, could be due to, now I'm, this is no conclusion or facts, but hypothesis, could be due to upregulation of chemical substances, like substance P, glutamate, being released from nerve fibers in the tendon during the exercise. And then you have the third stage, pain, which is there constantly, and uh, hyper excitability, which may be due to the sensitization. We discussed the peripheral sensitization with upregulation of nociceptors, uh, and also this can occur centrally in a similar manner. And very, very often you have, uh, if you have inflammation, you will also have pain. So the question now is, when exactly is what you describe there with ingrowth or pain that is coming, at what stage of the process is that coming? I mean, is the, is the pain coming a little bit too late actually, or is it, are there a lot of things going on, or can you argue that there is no inflammation? Because, you know, could it just be the pain comes from inflammation in the tendon? No, I, I would argue for the, 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 the combination of inflammation together with uh, nerve reactions and neuromediators. We know, uh, as I tried to explain, that the neuromediators and the nerve fibers are, are highly involved in fine-tuning uh, the, the immune response, the inflammatory response in the human body. So I think there's a, a complex interaction between the nervous and the inflammatory system in, in regulating uh, also uh, the pain in these patients. Okay, thank you very much once again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael, for giving me the opportunity to show some of our work here uh, at this uh, really interesting forum. Um, I'm a cell biologist and biophysicist, so this will really be a, a basic science talk. And one of uh, the main interests of our institute that is relatively young, we were founded in 2012, um, is the understanding of basic mechanisms in tendon development, in tendon aging, tendon degeneration and regeneration. And uh, one thing you necessarily tumble over when you look into basic mechanisms of tissue development is stem cells. And uh, for quite some time it has been known that, as in many other tissues, uh, in tendon there is a population of stem cells. And now I'm waiting for the, for the slide to really show you what these stem cells may look like.
Well, anyway, my first slide would have been empty just to attract your attention to what I'm saying, so you didn't really miss out a lot. Uh, yeah, so in many tissues of the body, there are stem and progenitor cells, and so is there in tendon, uh, tendon-derived stem cells in vitro at least have the possibility to differentiate into a variety of, uh, of cell types like adipocytes, chondrocytes, uh, um, and osteoblasts, they have a very good capacity to proliferate. The proliferation capacity of tendon-derived stem cells is way higher than what we know from mesenchymal stem cells from the bone marrow, for instance. So in working with, with stem and progenitor cells, a very important question to address is always to understand the stem cell niche. The stem cell niche is defined as the sum of all factors uh, influencing the stem cells in terms of proliferation in terms of differentiation or even migration. And in tendon, we know that it's, as we heard earlier on today, mechanical load is a very important factor uh, influencing tendon stem cells. Its extracellular matrix, particularly uh, fibromodulin and biglycane, were shown to massively influence the differentiation capacity of tendon stem cells. Uh, oxygen tension and some other biological factors like, uh, like uh, cytokines and so on are also believed to, to uh, be involved. Now we have shown that uh, tendon stem cells um, reside in the perivascular space as in many other tissues. Um, these cells, as you can see here, express both Stem, uh, tendon and stem cell associated markers like Scleraxis, Musashi 1 and Nestin. And if we isolate vessels from uh, human tendon samples and cultivate these vessel pieces, we get a nice uh, population of uh, cells that uh, will massively proliferate and express uh, a variety of uh, stem cell and tendon cell associated markers. Um, tendon is not the, by far not the only tissue uh, harboring perivascular stem cells. You know, like the nearly all tissues of the body, there are stem cells sitting around blood vessels, like for example, also the brain. So a very important question and a factor that is underlying the niche of perivascular stem cells is how tight are the vessels? Are they permeable or are they really tight? And as nobody has ever looked at this before in tendon, we decided, well, let's take a look what are the vessels like in tendon. And by ultrastructural analysis uh, of, uh, in this case, it's a mouse Achilles tendon, we see that the endothelium is non-fenestrated, it's continuous, and the kissing points of the stem cells shows a very, uh, a very tight proximity and tight junction-like structures. Looking at the molecular uh, expression of, of these tight junctions, I uh, may briefly explain what this is about. Uh, if a vessel is tight, the endothelia need to close the paracellular space. And this is uh, mediated by a large variety of molecules which have intra and extracellular domains. And with their extracellular domains, they seal the paracellular space like the zipper of a jacket. And we were looking for the most important ones, whether we find them in tendon or not. Um, yeah, some problem apparently with the presentation because there should be something behind it. So the anima animation appears gone. Maybe we can re-upload it from, from my stick. Very done. Yeah. Well done. Oh, talk a little more. Yeah. Well, sorry, so, sorry for the delay. We'll hope that it now works. Yeah, 
Okay, I can, I can do it from here. So I won't start from the beginning. I will try to move to the slide view. Yeah, now that it's there. Yeah, so um, the question was, are there uh, tight junction-specific proteins expressed? And indeed, there are both in mouse Achilles and human biceps tendon. We find occludin claudin 3 and claudin 5, and these are the main junctional proteins that will seal the paracellular space. And to our knowledge, um, this description of claudin 3 is the, uh, the first description of claudin 3 in endothelial cells outside the central nervous system or the retina. So this is uh, really, really sp specific uh, for, for tight junctions. Um, but the important question is, if we have the molecules, uh, do they really function? Is there a function to them? And in order to find this out, we perfused the animals with a 10 kilodalton dextrain tracer, um, which was allowed to circulate for 15 minutes, and then we checked whether it is stuck in the lumen of the vessel or it leaks out. Uh, in the brain, it looks like this, that you have the, um, uh, the tracer stuck in the lumen of the vessel. Whereas in the cardiac muscle, where you have leaky vessels, it will leak out. Now, the really exciting question is, what will we expect in tendon? And uh, to our surprise, indeed, uh, what we find is that the tracer, the 10 kilo tracer, is really stuck to the vessel lumen. So to summarize this first part, it's indeed more this uh, than that, the vessels that we have in tendon. Now, an important question is, okay, we see that serum usually in, in healthy state doesn't reach uh, the tendon, uh, the tendon uh, tissue. So what happens uh, if we disrupt this barrier? And so we decided for an, an in vitro approach and tried to see what happens if we challenge uh, tendon stem progenitor cells with increasing amounts of serum. And in terms of proliferation, what we see is not very much of a surprise. The more serum we add to the medium, the stronger the cells proliferate. And this is not due to uh, senescence or apoptosis. This is a reversible process. If we add serum to the cells, they start to proliferate. If we withdraw the serum, they will cease to proliferate. We can turn this on and off. Um, does serum influence differentiation? Uh, yes, it does. We uh, used a serum-free differentiation medium that is suitable to differentiate mesenchymal stem cells. It's called osteolife. It's a serum-free differ uh, differentiation medium, which works perfectly well with uh, mesenchymal stem cells, but it entirely fails in tendon cells, unless we add serum. So promoting, uh, adding serum really promotes osteogenesis within tendon cells. The same accounts for adipogenesis. Uh, this medium is then called adipolife, what a surprise, and it doesn't work in tendon cells unless we supply them uh, with medium. And we also see this on a transcription level with PPI or gamma on RNA levels. Um, now, uh, does it do something with matrix turnover? We looked at MMP9 activity and MMP2 expression uh, on uh, RNA level and uh, um, in, in, in cymography, and we see that indeed both MMP9 and MMP2 increase uh, their activities uh, with increased serum concentrations. One might argue uh, this could be because simply the cells are generally less active if they are cultivated without serum, but this is not the case because if we look at procollagen, we see that the expression levels of procollagen are not affected by the amount of serum we add, or not as dramatically. Um, so, summarizing, uh, what we see in healthy tendons that there is a barrier with very large similarities to the blood-brain barrier, and if we, if we simulate a breakdown of this barrier in vitro, we see that we get increased cell proliferation, that we get increased differentiation, and that we get uh, an increase uh, of catabolic factors. Now, what can we say about tendinopathy? And this is uh, something we're very limited in Austria, or at least at our institution, because regulatories are extremely strict and they won't allow us to take biopsies from tendinopathy material. So I'm really grateful to Michael Kier that he uh, provided us some cDNA from tendinopathy uh, patients. That was uh, material from Achilles tendons that have been tendinopathic for at least six months. Uh, it was a case control study, and the uh, uh, healthy control material was taken four centimeter proximal to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the tendinopathy area. 
And we were looking at one specific protein, which is called plasma lemma vesicle protein 1. This is a key uh, regulator of endothelial cell fenestration, to put this a bit illustrative. It, if you add PV1 to this, uh, you will get this. So it causes uh, endothelial cell fenestration. Now, what we see is that really PV1 is significantly upregulated in tendinopathy material. Um, we're looking at two other uh, important or interesting candidates, which is a Van Willebrand factor uh, and CD31. We don't see a change in CD31 exp expression, but Van Willebrand factor is decreased, and Van Willebrand factor decrease is very often associated with increased angiogenesis and an upregulation of VGF, which in turn uh, makes vessels more, uh, more permeable. VGF was formerly called vascular permeability factor. So I was asked to also uh, contribute a bit to the discussion on uh, tendinopathy and inflammation. And uh, thinking of vascular permeability and uh, inflammation, what comes to my mind is that we know, for example, from the blood-brain barrier that systemic inflammatory processes uh, uh, compromise the blood-brain barrier and lead to an increased uh, incidence of, for example, Alzheimer's disease. So looking at risk factors, we heard that quite a few times earlier on today. Uh, besides being Keith Richards, obesity and uh, diabetes are uh, risk factors. And one thing aging rheumatoid arthritis, smoking, diabetes, and obesity have in common is that they represent a systemic low-grade inflammation. This is a thing all of these uh, states or behaviors have in common. So um, we want to know, does systemic inflammation affect tendons? And first of all, we were looking into, this is mouse data, it's not human material. We're looking at what kind of inflammatory or, or immune cells do we have in intact healthy tendon? And we find a, an interesting population of CD68 positive cells that are also positive for sclerosis. What does that mean? These are not some macrophages that invaded the tendon from somewhere, but they reside there and express tendon cell markers. Same accounts for CD163, F480, and so on. So there is a population of resident macrophages in intact mouse tendons. Now, we wanted to see what happens if we uh, cause a systemic inflammation in a mouse. So what we did was we uh, applied an asthma model. That means we immunized mice with a Timothy grass pollen allergen for two weeks. That means we made them allergic or asthmatic. And then after uh, a few weeks, we challenged them with, the, with this uh, grass pollen allergen and caused a systemic inflammation. So these animals developed asthma. And uh, we did a lot of cytokine profiling, and we really see that they have a very nice uh, Th2 type of immune response. And now we were looking at the tendon, and what we see indeed is really a response in the tendon. I'm going to draw your attention here to MHC2, which is apparently upregulated. This is really work in progress, so we're still doing the quantification, and this is really data absolutely fresh from the lab. We see a loss in uh, CD206, which would uh, indicate a switch from an M2 to an M1 macrophage subtype. And we also did uh, some biomechanical tests, and what we see is that really load to failure, the maximum tensile load is significantly decreased in the asthmatic animals. So this has nothing to do with the local inflammation tendon. The fl inflammation goes on in the lungs, and we have an effect on the tendons. So, uh, summarizing this uh, inflammation part, we see that mouse tendons harbor cells with a macrophage phenotype, and apparently these cells or the whole tendon reacts to uh, systemic inflammation. Well, and as this is a basic research talk, it always has to come up with more questions than answers. Um, what we really need to find out is the blood tendon bar barrier compromised in tendinopathy, besides some RNA data that we have. Uh, could it be a novel treatment target to, to, to tackle uh, tendinopathy, to try to retighten the, the, the vessels? Should we really go for treatments that increase the levels of VEGF? Should we be euphoric if anything we inject come brings VEGF up? Um, and 
can we find a correlation in humans between uh, systemic inflammatory diseases and tendinopathy? There is one major problem in that because most systemically inflammatory diseases are at some point treated with high doses of corticosteroids, and we know very well that uh, corticosteroids affect tendons and increase the risk, so we would probably mimic, or, or, or we, we would probably uh, not see the effects of the systemic inflammation. Uh, so I would like to thank you for your attention and the people who did the work with me, mainly Christine Elena, uh, my colleague and wife who is in charge of the uh, tendon barrier project, and also to the people who gave us some money. Thank you very much.